Radhika, please introduce him. Uh, I'm sorry, so I uh, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, <clears throat> just a second. Uh, okay, so uh, am I am I audible and visible? Yes. Okay. Uh, Dr. Adhanala Hangu is a well-known professor and former vice chancellor of uh, Allahabad University and Kalyani University in West Bengal. He is India's only historian to be appointed to the United States Academic Council and to have served as vice chancellor of the esteemed council twice. Um, he's also well known for his work on the history of medieval India, and he has worked in a number of universities over the course of his 40 year long career. Professor Hanglu has also taught at the University of Srinagar, Northeastern Hill University, uh, Central University of Punjab and the University of Hyderabad. He was born in Kashmir's picturesque valley to a Kashmiri Pandit farmer. Um, he has graduated from Kashmir University and went on to earn his MPhil PhD and postdoctoral degree from Jawaharlal Nehru University. Professor Hanglu was awarded the honorary rank of Colonel, a senior position in the Indian Army for promoting NSS and NCC in Kalyani and Allahabad, and a great honorary achievement for a civilian for his outstanding work as an academician and administrator. Professor Hanglu has also served as the chairperson of Indian history at several foreign universities. In addition, in 1997, he was awarded a Dad Fellowship by the Federal Republic of Germany to conduct research on economic history of India at Heidelberg University South Asian Institute. He was also given a Fulbright Fellowship at the University of Delaware in Philadelphia. In 1998, Professor Hanglu was invited to deliver the first, uh, first Bud Singh Dillon uh, Memorial Lecture by the Gadar Heritage Foundation of California. He was also um, offered by the government of India to chair Indian studies at universities such as the University of West Indies, uh, St. Augustine campus, uh, Trinidad and Tobago for two years in 27, uh, 2007. In 2011, he was offered a two-year position as chair of Indian studies at Georgia's Tbilisi University. Professor Hang Liu has authored more than half a dozen books, including Agrarian System of Kashmir, 1846 to 1900, State in Medieval Kashmir, uh, Approaching Islam, and New Themes in Indian History, Politics, Gender, Environment, and Culture. He has also published several research articles, including Kashmiriyat, The Voice of the Past Misconstrued, and Kashmiriyat Agriculture Technology in Kashmir. The book Kashmir, uh, Before and After Accession by Professor Hanglu, is a bestseller on Amazon. Professor Hanglu has devoted his life to the study of Kashmir and has published over 150 essays in national and international journals. He is a multilinguist who speaks Persian, Sanskrit, Urdu, and Hindi fluently. He is also a Urdu literature poet. Um, he was also recently appointed honorary vice chancellor of Noble University in Toronto, Canada. It gives me great, great pleasure to greet you, sir. We are truly honored by your gracious presence and we eagerly await your monumental lecture, which will undoubtedly be very um, eye-opening for us and it will, will broaden our knowledge on the subject. On behalf of the entire college, I would like to thank you for accepting our invitation to deliver a lecture on our podium and for your presence today. Over to you, Sanya. Thank you, Radhika. Now I'd like to call Ashwini Shankar, sir, our teacher in charge, to formally welcome our speaker. <clears throat> Am I audible? Yes, sir. Uh, Professor Ratan Lal Hamilu, Professor Harbans Mukhia, Professor Subhash Sarkar, a galaxy of scholars in the gathering, friends, colleagues, and my dear students. It's a matter of great delight for me to welcome Professor Hang Lu to the second edition of Eminent Historian Series of Origin Today. Trained as a historian of medieval times, Professor Hang Lu's overs has been Kashmir affairs, Indian history, culture, and politics, Indian diaspora, Central Asia religion, politics, and culture.
I am now thinking of digressing from what has been introduced, what has been talked about by Radhika Pandita, because uh, introducing a colossal scholar of his stature is an uphill task, is a tall order. Friends, Kashmir is in, a, is in the midst of all of us. In other words, it hovers large in our thinking. In terms of presence, it has a quotidian value and carries the immense potential to stretch and tax our imagination. And yet, despite its presence writ large, it seems in more ways than one to be an eternal mystery. In what's different, an oxymoron, it is whose truces are tied in a knot, which more often than not is an impossibility of a task to untie and unravel. We never refrain away from holding a position on or about Kashmir, and yet we seldom ever probe ourselves critically with the question that beyond commonplaces information, how much of our, our, our opinion about it is historically informed, and that too with reference to an objective and unprejudiced an analysis. Further, we do realize and acknowledge that the situation in Kashmir is an imbroglio. The critical question though is that what is the way out of this intractable condition? Does the resolution to this complex of matrix reside in the realm of political with national and global state actors as dramatis persona or will it come from the realization of the idea that an introspective mediation is an absolute necessity but the set task needs to be navigated through the process and passage whose contours need to be defined with reference to a sedate and reflective, reflective recognition of the selves and the communities which have otherwise situated themselves in a presumed antithetical relationships with each other in relative or recent past. To help us seek answers for such complicated issues, we have Amit Sas, Professor Hanglu. We now request you, sir, to kindly reflect upon these critical issues and educate us about the historical, cultural, and political sociological dynamics of the conundrum that Kashmir otherwise seems to be. Over to Professor Hanglu. I now once again welcome you, Professor Hanglu, without much of without taking much of your essential time. Very good morning to all of you and many thanks for having me this morning. Let me first of all acknowledge the presence or net presence of my great teacher and guru, Professor Harban Smukhya, our estimate principal, Professor Rajesh Agarwalji, Dr. Aditya Saxena, my friend, Dr. Ashwini Shankarji, who is teacher in charge and a great engine purpose behind this series of lectures. Sania Afreen, who is monitoring this whole thing. Dr. Yasir Arafat, my colleagues at Delhi University and the young man, Dr. Abhishek, who is also present there and the person who contacted me and facilitated this talk now. I also acknowledge the presence of two young girls, girl students who talked about my work, etc. Let me first of all, when we talk in terms of contemporary perspectives on Kashmir, you know, I would at the very outset like to say that when political rituals of any country are performed subtly, you know, it also establishes subtler connections, strong connections between that country's state and public. And in 
case of Kashmir, in case of India, what we find, in fact, because Kashmir should not be studied in isolation. That would be my request to all people, with all our ideologies, with all our prejudice, with all our fascination for certain, you know, uh, cultures. We must, as a historian, be disloyal to prejudice when we talk about Kashmir. That's what my guru has always taught me. Therefore, when we talk about contemporary perspectives, why is it that we are talking about contemporary perspectives or we are talking as Dr. Shankar very rightly said that we shall have to try to untie all those knots by looking into historical cultural perspectives and other things, you know, when we talk of Kashmir. We are talking of Kashmir today because it has occupied large space in political, intellectual, social, and religious circles for more than a century now almost. We are talking about it because it has provided itself as a potential weapon for polarizing societies in South Asia and more particularly India and Pakistan. We are also talking about Kashmir because it has been a flashpoint of so many wars right from 1947 till date. This problem has also been intertwined with the Cold War in South Asia, globalization, liberalization, growth of various tendencies which are connected with the opening of Ram Temple in India and its aftermath. It's also a connection because after dealing with the Kashmir the Indian state, I don't know whether Indian state has realized that or not, should realize that the democracy in India has also fatigued by now. And that we get to know only when we study Kashmir problem. The association of four wars right from 1947 up to the proxy war that is going on now. But before we take up this discussion about the contemporary perspectives that this Kashmir problem has thrown up, let me illustrate certain points for historical background, as Dr. Shankarji has reminded me. You see, we must remember that there are two scenarios in Kashmir. One is pre-partition scenario, the other is post-partition scenario. We should first of all break the entire problem into two parts. When we look at pre-partition scenario, when Pakistan was not, Pakistan of today was not there, I would say. This problem has roots in British colonial ambitions and the phenomenon of nationalism in Europe and Asia, including Eastern Europe. It has also roots in Anglo-Commercial, Anglo-Russian commercial rivalry, which we also call the great game. And it has also roots in the growth of political consciousness among Muslims in particular in South Asia, right from the beginning of the 18th century and after. And it has also a relationship. It has something to do with Kashmir's centrality of topography that was seen as great advantage of Kashmir region almost up to 1947 or 52. When we look at post-independent scenario, what we find is in post-independent scenario, we have two important players. On one side is Pakistan, on the other side is India. I would say rest of India so that nobody feels offended. I'm also an Indian, there's no doubt about it. But as historians, we have to be doubly conscious. In post-independent era also, the regional aspirations of Kashmir have also to be looked into. The regional aspirations of Kashmir and Kashmiris have to be looked into. Islam has to be looked into as an international religion, which has a close relationship with the Kashmiris and that relationship grows from 1947 onwards. We should have to also look at conflicting pockets of, you know, conflicting pockets where involvement of Muslims all over the world is taking place. After 9-11, we shall have also to look at the question of terrorism. Because I would like to say that 
some of the genuine struggles also which were taking place in various parts of the world were all brought under one umbrella of terrorism. You see, I am sure if we would have not fought our freedom struggle in 1947 and before that, which got freedom to this country, I am sure our struggle against colonialism would have also been brought under terrorism and we would have been declared as terrorists at this point of time if that struggle would have prolonged and we should not have got freedom. Because interestingly, you see, you find on one side when Palestine and Israel conflict goes on, the Palestinians are terrorists, even though they may be fighting for their own state. But Israelis may not be, because they have the backing of greater powers. And that gives legitimacy to this condemnation and to the aspirations of other people. Likewise, we find that the other problem after 47 is when we try to trace the problem of Kashmir, is India's approach, in fact, the Indian approach to the problem. Am I audible to everyone? Yes, sir, you are audible. Okay. okay. So the other problem is that Indian approach to Kashmir problem, wherein we find that from 47 almost to the most recent times, and including today also, I find that whenever Pakistan has been proactive or active towards Kashmir, we have responded to that. Seriously speaking, we have not taken Kashmir problem in an integrated manner from 1947. That has also been one of the reasons which has led to this accumulation of crisis that's exploding day in and day out. So keeping both these issues of pre-47 and post-47 scenario separate, let us go a little further. Let us go a little deeper into the problem. We find that the sale of Kashmir to British took place for 75 lakhs of rupees in 1846. Kashmiris were all along with their mountains, along with rivers, along with people, along with women and children, were sold for no fault of theirs in 1947 for 75, 46, for uh, 1846 for 75 lakhs of rupees to a Sikh, Army Lieutenant Maharaja Gulab Singh, who was declared as Maharaja by the British at that point of time. And there were reasons for that. The reasons were that because in late 18th century, the East India Company became seriously interested in trans Himalayan trade. The battles of trade have been going on today also. You look at what's happening in Ukraine and uh, how European countries and Americans and other countries are you know, responding to all these developments. And what are the mood points if you look at sale of petroleum products, the sale of gas, sale of meat, sale of many other items and so on. Likewise, we find in 18th, late 18th century, East India Company became very, very seriously interested in trans Himalayan trade to stop Russian advance in this direction was the main task of the British at that point of time, which brought Kashmir to the main focus. We found that Russians were gaining strength to strength and trying to overpower Western Europeans. I would also mention, like to mention a point here. You see, uh, today we are looking at the scenario of Putin versus the NATO. And in that process, when we look at 1949, you see NATO was created at that point of time only to stop the Russian advance or Russian threat to the European countries and so on. Likewise, we find when Russia was gaining strength, at that point of time, Anglo-American bloc, particularly the Europeans, they thought of stopping the Russian advance. And as a result, we find that these developments you know, took place to stop the Russians and to monopolize the entire trade into the region because Russian economy was gaining strength. We have the figures to illustrate that 2.4% of the resources were being spent by British people on army or on militarization at that point of time, which was far more larger amount than French, British, and Italians put together. 
the amount of money that Russians, French and British were pouring for military and other resources, Russia was in a lonely responsible for all these things because Russia had immense amount of income at that point of time, rather much more than European countries put together. In such circumstances, we find that the British colonial masters who were only adept in exercising, you know, coercion and in developing the connections, networks through colonial settlement, collaboration, coercion, they kept in view the faster growth of Russian economy and Russian militarization and therefore tried to stop it. British thought in, for this in fact, British thought that we should liquidate the Sikh empire or Sikh positions which were spread over Punjab and Kashmir. And this depended on the resources of Sikh state. This depend on the resources of Sikh state and it also provided strategic positions to uh, the British people, in fact. I would like to mention here, there's a book called E.F. Knight, who says Kashmir is a place where three empires meet. He's only talking of Russia, China, and India. But I would say five empires, small or big, because it has a border with Tibet, it has a border with China, it has a border with Russia, it has also a border with the rest of India this side. We have interesting piece of evidence. There are plenty of, you know, files. There is plenty of literature available on this. But let me illustrate one of the evidence here. The chairman of East India Company, known as H.B. Bailey, he writes to Hobhouse, the president of company's board of control on 11th of January, 1841. 1841 during the period, in fact, 1841, 42, right up to 45 when Anglo-Sikh wars took place. And I read the bit of correspondence here for your information. Hobhouse writes to the Board of Control that I believe we should have no difficulty in withdrawing from Afghanistan. If we occupied the line of Indus, our moral influence in that case would be more efficacious than the present than the presence of British force holding complete occupation over Afghanistan. Even if the holding of force in Afghanistan is necessary, we should find in the resource of Punjab resources necessary for their maintenance. And with Kashmir, particularly, I want to mention here, he says the last line is, and with Kashmir on our plan the whole line of Indus in our position, we might defy all attacks from both Asian and European enemies, you can imagine. That if they are having Kashmir as a strategic place under their control, they can defy all attacks from Russia or Europe or any other enemy in fact. That's how Kashmir became very, very important to colonial masters. You know, when we look at the history at that point of time about Kashmir, right from say 14th century onwards, we find that Kashmir was really exploited by rulers who entered from outside the country. Be it Shahmir dynasty except to Zainal Abdin, be it Chaks who came from outside, be it Mughals, even though Emperor Akbar did a lot of good things also, we must remember for Kashmir. But post Mughal period, we find it was complete devastation. I have been often saying, if you look at the figures, Afghans had no interest who ruled Kashmir from 1753 up to 1890. They had no interest in developing Kashmir at all. No interest in people's you know, affairs at all. The largest amount of revenue that Afghanistan got from all and it is all places, the largest part came from Kashmir all. Likewise, the Sikhs also had no interest except to, you know, exact as much of revenue as possible. And Dogras crossed all limits in this direction. They crossed all limits in this direction in terms of exploiting because like they had invested, you know, 75 lakhs of rupees in purchasing it from the British. Therefore, they tried to fleece people as much as possible. This was why British 
sold Kashmir for 75 lakhs to Maharaja Gulab Singh, who was the lieutenant of Sikh army. The sale was, I would say, it was much far more worse than the partition of Morocco, where people did not know why Moroccans were around 1909, I think, or 11, when Moroccans were divided. Until then, there were close contacts between Kashmiris and Central Asians, Kashmiris and Eastern Europe, Kashmiris and Western Europe, and there was a good going of trade between Kashmir and other parts of Central Asia and Western Europe and Eastern Europe. The three things that happened at that point of time, you know, when Maharaja Gulab Singh took over and when Dogras, you know, controlled Kashmir, the three things that happened, which was worst for Kashmir's economy, one was the monopolization of trade by Maharaja, like the feudal iktadars, you know, he controlled the entire area and monopolized the entire shawl and craft trade, trade in artisanal production completely which was not monopolized by people earlier, except that they were taxing it very heavily. Second important aspect you know, of this story is at that point of time is that Kashmiris basically had, you know, they don't have a good going of agriculture. Even now, I would say, because for six months of the year, the weather is not supporting Kashmir's agriculture. Besides, if you go out from the main city, Srinagar, I would say, I wouldn't talk about Baramulla or Anantanag or Islamabad and other areas. But if you go out from Srinagar city, hardly at 20 kilometers distance, 15 kilometers distance, from all around in the four directions you find, it is mountains. And what we refer in Hindi, we call it Kandi Ilakas. You know, the land that's not very much fertile, that's not suitable to agriculture throughout the year. These problems were there. And this problem was further, you know, heightened because of the crisis that took place, because you were supplementing your agrarian economy with artisanal production. And now your artisanal production and trade has been monopolized. You are left to fend for yourself from agriculture. And in agriculture, the heavy taxation has taken place. And you are also left with very little amount of sustenance, you see, so far as your agriculture is concerned. The third important thing was that because of the presence of the British and because of this trade monopolization, you required large amount of labor, you know, to carry goods, to carry luggage of British army, British soldiers on the Gilgit Highway. Therefore, the third attack took place on the individual freedoms and liberties and labor of the individuals in Kashmir because Kashmiris were subjected severe forced unpaid labor bega. One of the great poets of Kashmir who died in Pak occupied Kashmir, Mahmuddin Fok, one of the early writers, he says, Ek to begar le fir is pa mazduri na de, maarte hai ah zalim teer bhi talwar. You know, he is very clearly, he has done a lot of work on Kashmir, around 112 books in Urdu on different aspects of Kashmir's history and society. So we find that peasant is where third important aspect is that peasant was subjected to severe exploitation by Dogras, which completely destroyed trade and agriculture in the valley. So there was no artisanal production forthcoming, and agriculture was also completely impoverished. Then in addition to this, we find that Kashmir got into different wars indirectly, different wars indirectly in the sense that rather I would say Kashmir was, you know, its entanglement with the war was purely economic. It had immense amount of economic consequence. I'll give an example. For example, Kashmir is used to sell their shawl and other artisanal production in Western Europe. And in Western Europe, when Franco-Prussian war took place in 1870s, the doors were completely closed. So this phenomenon of wars also played a great havoc with the Kashmir's trade and economy. Then the question of nationalism, consolidation of nationalism in Western Europe, that we all Germans, we all French, we all Italians, we all Spanish. When this question came up, the Kashmiri soldiers started withdrawing from there. 
the same tendency continued you know when russian revolution of 1905 to 1917 the consolidation of soviet union took place we find that the doors to kashmiris were completely closed central asia and western europe on the other side then of course the two world wars 1913 1939 onwards the age old exploitation was further heightened during dogra period as i said and the impact of modernization or other colonial modernization on south asian muslims and south asians there is a south asian muslims because pak occupied kashmir and kashmir majority of the people were of course muslims so therefore that modernization also colonial modernization also impacted these people are you able to hear me yes i am okay okay please inform me because sometimes we have these power breakups in jnk very frequent thanks to government of india and its development so in addition to this we find that the growth of political these, these all forces you find you see world war taking place second world war taking place india's freedom struggle going on on the other side we find the growth of political consciousness in south asia you know and of course in kashmir and india therefore it is also impacting we find that this was also impacting the mind of kashmiris apart from his economic conditions kashmiris had immense amount of increasing amount of interaction with punjab the interaction was so much with punjab you can imagine if you look at traditional you know literature you find that kashmir is called everything and anything outside kashmir as punjab if anybody would come from madras also they would say he has come from punjab because their in only interaction was with punjab very much and this interaction further increased and brought in new influences from 1905 because 1905 was a very critical year in 1905 we find that jhelum valley road was opened up which linked you know kashmir with uh, what was what what is what is present pakistan punjab in fact and besides this we find that from 1885 the residency was imposed in 1889 british residency was imposed on maharaja and the kashmir region in 1889 and we have a kind of dual government you know even if you want to complain even if you want to protest you don't know against who you protest do you protest against the maharaja or do you protest against the british so therefore that dual government also continued to control the region as a result of all these measures you know you cannot be a beautiful valley and say i want to participate in world economy without trading products without agricultural production you cannot go to the trade you cannot go to different market places you cannot participate in world economy at all therefore whatever little influence that had been brought in by the britishers as part and parcel of colonialism or world economy that completely collapses by the beginning of 20th century as a result of this we find that regional political consciousness took place and initially we find a muslim conference and association of young muslim people in fact took place in lahore that gradually entered kashmir here i would like to uh, make couple of points in the sense that you know we have the worst thing in fact i would like to say here that has ever happened to any region this is all for historians to know you tell me a single freedom struggle the freedom struggle of tribes the freedom struggle of you know nagas mizos maites people in jharkhand six satnami is earlier not freedom struggle their protest against the mughal rule and others just tell me one place in the world where the freedom struggle of public genuine freedom struggle of genuine struggle of people because as historians you know we can't put a kind of blank sheet before our eyes and start denying this was not this this was not this so that's not true let us place facts before uh, our students and future generation and for all of you the problem is kashmir is freedom struggle the struggle that started before 1947 the struggle started way back in 
Initially, it was referred as Kashmir Muslim Conference. Now, this freedom struggle has been condemned so much and is under condemnation even today. You know, without making a distinction between what is radical Islam, what is communal Hinduism, what is communal Muslim Islam, what are other factors, we are just dabbing it all through. I think that is not a genuine service we are doing to those people who lost their lives, you know, freeing Kashmir from the Dogra rule. It would not be really uh, justice, you know, on our part, in fact, for those people. We find that it has been completely condemned every day in and day out. I see it on the net. I see it in social media. Every day it's being, it's being you know, condemned in such a worse fashion, which, which really is not good, in fact. And so long as you continue to do that, you can't get solutions to Kashmir problem at all. Here, I would like to say that this Muslim conference, you know, which people are picking up that it was Muslim conference, therefore it was not a freedom struggle. We must go back a little here and look at various parts of India. You look at the struggle that Satrami is launching against the Mughals. Look at the struggle that Marathas, Sikhs, Jats, and various others who launched a protest against the Mughal Empire. Don't you think that, you know, they used religious symbols, in fact, for mobilization of public? As part of the protesting ideology, they certainly used religion. You know, there's no doubt about it. That they initially use, because you see, if the majority classes are belonging to a particular religion, what happens even today, I would say. I mean, why, why we say so much of Hindutva around? Because majority classes, we are there, although this majority is completely fractured in India, further divided into bits and pieces. But of course, you know, politicians are always shameless characters, you can't help it. So therefore, they keep on mobilizing religion for, you know, uh, mobilizing public. Likewise, at that point of time, if the earlier trend was that religion was used for political ideological purposes, therefore, this small struggle that started for freeing region from the Maharaja, they also used it initially a Muslim name so that they can woo majority classes in Kashmir. You know, the Kashmir majority of Kashmir is very illiterate peasants, illiterate shalbafis, illiterate craftsmen, you know, there are small minority, very little people. In fact, I would say very few people among the urban pandits and the Sayyids who were, you know, uh, literate in some sense or the other. And therefore, the rest of the people were majority of Muslims. Therefore, for wooing them, the struggle initially was named as Kashmir Muslim Conference for a short period of time, from 1931 up to 1939, nearly a decade almost. And from 1939, we find Sheikh Mahmoud Abdullah enters this scene. He comes to the forefront and distances those people who would call it only Muslim conference. He said, no, it's a national conference. Because in this exploitation, we have Hindus, we have Sikhs, we have other people also. So therefore, it's a national conference. This was, by the way, this was the first political party in entire South Asia, I would say. The first political, regional political, not political party, regional political party we find. The national conference was named, you know, it, it was applied to this entire struggle. And Sheikh Hubdra, as the champion of anti feudal struggle, emerges as a great leader, in fact, at that point of time. But unfortunately, even, even some of the, you know, I would say trained historians also, I, I don't know whether to call them historians or what because with a amount of prejudice, they all condemn this. They said this struggle was completely communal. They, they are not characterizing this struggle on the basis of what happened from 1931 up to 1939, but they are communalizing our past from present point of view. They are looking at it from 1947 onwards and then going back and saying that struggle was totally communal. You see, we have plentiful of literature to illustrate Sheikh Hudra and some of the National Conference leaders making appeals from the rooftops to the public that look here it's not a communal we are all one everybody is welcome in this association against you know fight against the, the dogra rulers and so on so finally we find that 1947 we got freedom and we protested against the maharaj and ultimately kashmir became completely free from the dogra
you see uh, when when we uh, fought for this freedom and freedom from the dogra raj was attained we find that kashmiris did not really get their conditions better they were not their conditions were not ameliorated at all with the end of maharaja's rule the conditions began to worse worsen further in fact because of partition of india in two countries i don't say two nations because my opinion about nationalism is different in fact so i intentionally do not use the word nation because we are a kind of what one can say a civilizational nation you see when we talk of india we don't know about pakistan whether it continues to be a nation or what nation because it calls itself sometimes islamic democracy sometimes secular democracy sometimes military rule sometimes dictatorship sometimes something so therefore we should be very careful in using these terms of nation and nationalism when we look at both the countries i would say my country as well as their country it's here the the effort to settle the political future of kashmir begins after we became free the effort to settle the political future of kashmir is begins and that effort to settle the political future of kashmir has not been you know brought to the end till date i would say till today in fact i would say it has it has really not been set the matter has not been settled because in 1947 there is no doubt about it that loss of humanity and property took place because of communal rights that happened in pakistan communal rights that happened in india communal rights that happened in the part that the, the area that came to be constituted as pakistan later i would say you know and and what happened in india as such we have an interesting in piece of information you see when this was happening in delhi nobody except nehru nobody was in a position to listen to the kashmiris because on one side anglo american bloc was pushing things for trying to see kashmir in the different perspective and light i have i have a reference that one abdul qayyum from russia also talked to sheikh abdul and bula mohammed sadik at that point of time asking them leave this all place and you better join like a central asian khanate you join russia at that point of time you can imagine that pulls and pressures of different directions pakistan was thinking that we have large amount of muslim population therefore kashmiris belong to us nehru wanted indian secular tradition to be strengthened and therefore he was under the impression that i should have the largest population of muslims in india than pakistan to strengthen india's multiculturalism the question of plurality which is under attack after nehru left now so therefore all people were pulling in different directions which was certainly influencing kashmiri mind and the mind of kashmiri leadership it was amidst these circumstances that kashmiris were made to sign a kind of accession on paper which was ratified by sheikh mahmud abdullah and they were promised that certain settlements would be carried out in different directions so far as the kashmir region is concerned its political future would be settled there are lots of circumstances in fact you know which surround this partition and settlement of political future of kashmir at that point of time from 1947 to 1953 and in 1953 the leader who had a mass follow who was the legitimate political leader of kashmir was put behind the bars he was put behind the bars because people say he wanted to make kashmir a khanate some say he wanted kashmir to be part of pakistan you know which is not true when we look at historical documentation field work oral history and of course we have lived during these years and known that leader very well that was not true neither he wanted to go to pakistan that story starts much much later after 1953 nor he wanted independent kashmir 
but he asked the government of india at that point of time certain arrangements to be worked out with regard to foreign policy with regard to defense with regard to economy of kashmir with regard to you know autonomy of polity at that point of time which were completely denied to him because we find that at that point of time kashmir india's mind was obsessed with partition that which is bound to be because political crisis had taken place families had got divided properties were looted people were killed women were raped all kinds of ills had followed and therefore it was bound to stay in human mind for some time today we are talking of reconciliation i think that reconciliation should have taken place at that point of time because as historians this violence at that point of time is nothing new for us because we have had plenty of such things happening in history of different regions at different points of time in the world so as a result of this we find that when indian mind was completely obsessed in the parliament everybody emphasized including patel except nehru everybody emphasized that we should first of all integrate kashmir as if it was a matchbox to be lifted from the shop and to put it in pocket and say i have integrated kashmir with india you know integration has to start somewhere in the heart of public integration has to start in a policy approach integration has to start in attitude of the dominant power when it is integrating smaller states that's where integration has to start in your attitude that did not happen everybody said that if sheikh abdullah is the only person because he was raising questions if government of india at that point of time should have provided answers to the questions of sheikh abdullah i am sure kashmir would have been far more peaceful and settled than what it is now that did not happen because praja parishad workers started agitation in jammu this agitation began to spread to various parts this agitation was also facilitated by some of the leaders in fact who died later and this agitation was started in jammu it spread to up it spread to punjab as a result we find more than 200 people died in violence and immediately the only point that government of india saw at that point of time they felt as if sheikh abdullah was the only person who was responsible for this which was not his fault because he had publicly spoken very fearlessly that if we are not given this arrangement we shall have to certainly do some kind of a rethinking at that point of time but that was not allowed as a result of which when these crises took place sheikh abdullah was completely he was arrested and put behind the bars that opened up a new chapter in kashmir's history now look at various kinds of complexities that are taking place at that point of time i compare the role of pakistan from 47 till 1990 or till date the role of pakistan in kashmir with role of india in kashmir when i look at both the players good or bad i feel that pakistan has won and india has lost the match because look at the policy pakistan may be our enemy may be the rival in the party but let me give you a little example here 1947 we became free 1946 pakistan opened up the office of jamaat islami in kashmir and jamaat islami went on developing a rural based educated middle class in kashmir while as india did short term solutions remove sheikh abdullah you put bakshi gulam ahmed there he creates further crisis you remove him and put some nincompoor ruler there change him and bring in another person do enter you know into the defection politics and keep on changing basically all these things they are impacting the common public in kashmir which is today angry which feel is completely strangulated to them that is perspective of kashmir that has to be understood in fact so as a result of this when you put sheikh abdullah behind the bars and in the meantime you have seen that jamaat islami and sheikh abdullah began to talk about the same language same language in the sense that if jamaat islami was saying that we become part of islamic world and taking the channel through pakistan nizam e mustafa and so on sheikh abdullah was also saying we don't want to be part of india he said in one of the interviews that if unless injustice done to sheikh abdullah is under how can kashmiris think apart they can part and parcel of india that was what sheikh abdullah said 
and when government of india began to read between the lines what jamaat islami is saying and sheikh khudra they try to create a wedge and at that point of time, time jamaat islami was brought into fight the elections in 1977 elections you can know. the same party we call communal today but the same party participated in elections they were sitting in the assembly and taking oath of the constitution of india where was government of india at that point of time you see we have done basically we we just want solutions to the problems have above not from the below that has been one of the serious handicaps of kashmir policy players in in kashmir so therefore the contemporary perspectives that are offered are very very complex now at this point of time you see whether we accept it or not looking at it from those people who wanted to break away from kashmir they call the struggle that it's a freedom struggle because we are fighting for independence we say that they are you know militants and after 911 we say they are terrorists but their perceptions that they have fought for freedom they are shaheed in fact martyrs as per public perception as per their own perception and from 1990 till date what is the solution that we have provided to the kashmir problem when we look at this perspective i am skipping deliberately certain details because it will take hours and hours to debate it in fact we have increased the presence of military we have spent huge amount of money in purchasing of arms to equip our soldier better to some extent in the post narsimharao period we have spent little money for developing the road networks railways in kashmir what is the other thing that we have provided to kashmir in terms of integrating the region with rest of india from 1990 after the whole thing you know exploded you see we all hate violence there is no doubt about it but from 1990 we have also facilitated communal polarization on one side by pakistan on the other side india has also done no less in polarizing people and creating a greater amount of confusion if article 370 abolition of article 370 in 2019 has been the final shot in integration then why is target killing taking place just day before in the night time a rajput person in kakran kulgam was shot and we don't know in another 24 hours who will be the next we have integrated if abolition of article 370 was a answer to these things then there should be completely peace then why should there be presence of so much of army you know presence of army in any region we have great respect for our soldiers that they are doing a great job to protect this country selflessly there is no doubt about it but we must also remember that a particular region's privacy has been disturbed these are basically government of india's assets meet upper reaches of himachal upper reaches of up best places in northeast kashmir you know because it fetches us huge amount of income through tourism it also helps you know in mitigating certain diseases like chest diseases and so on when the patients are brought from delhi to kashmir so these are our assets in fact apart from people in these regions and states they are great assets of india 
but these assets are destroyed too. Therefore, Article 370's abolition of 35A has not led to the establishment of peace in Kashmir. That's my worry. And from center's perspective, without looking at the ground reality, we say, no, now the problem is, is over. Why the problem is over? We think that everybody from different states of India would pick up his bedding, her bedding and reach Kashmir and settle down, construct a house overnight and say, you people, bloody Kashmiris, we have reduced you to minority. We are overwhelming you with the majority. That cannot happen. Nations do not grow that way at all. Nations grow by compassion. Nations grow by hard work. Nations grow by promoting peace. Nations go by promoting harmony, promoting plurality, promoting multiculturalism, promoting economy, looking for the avenues to keep people busy, channelizing their different energies and perspectives in different directions. The nations do not grow and become integrated. If I say that I take 5,000 people and 5,000 Nagas will be reduced now, there will be 5,000 people from UP in Nagaland, so Nagas cannot do anything. Have we understood culture? Have we studied culture? This question I would like really to ask our politicians of the country. What do they mean by India's culture? Indian civilization, Indian ethos, Indian multiculturalism, Indian pluralism, and the personality of India as a whole. And then a delimitation commission comes. Delimitation commission Coming up delimitation commission itself is a big hoax. Because I want to divide if I am not in a position to shift the population quickly to make them into minority. Then what I am doing? Let me divide the constituencies now. First of all, I bifurcate Ladakh from, if not trifurcation, at least bifurcation. Jammu and Kashmir separate, Ladakh separate. Let me tell you a very, very important point here that future historians will judge it. I may be stupid if I say like that, but my stupid mind says I must say. Bifurcation of Ladakh from Kashmir region is one of the historical Himalayan blunders that has been done. Because in this entire you know, chain, you have removed one element in that chain. So it is becoming loose now gradually. Earlier we would say that we want to, if we have to bring people tomorrow on the table, we want to bring a person from Ladakh, we want to bring Jammu people, we want to bring Kashmir. This region belongs to all the three of them. And therefore, let us decide what would be your political future. Today we cannot do that. Because we have given solution to Ladakh is that you please be out of this mess. And we have only Jammu and Kashmir now. So therefore, the Kashmiris are asking that we are also not happy with this. Then how do we look at this problem? Which is happening now. Which is happening now. And our greatest threat now is, you must have seen for more than a year, we have not talked about politics with Pakistan at all. Because the China is a big bear is sitting on our back. So now the Ladakhis become culturally more specific with Tibetan and Chinese cultural traditions because we have taken them out from multiculturalism and brought them into a singular unit of ethnicity now, which is not helpful. All over the effort has been to make it like a mainland. But when we look at the mainland impressions, the Dakwaiti, raping of women, you know, plunder, theft, these are the mainland influences that come much before, you know, any better development travels to that region. As a result, the Iraqis want specifically to protect their culture from these things, and therefore they are happy that they are separate now from JNK. The no development has taken place. We, we, we don't see any visible development taking place in Ladakh, Kargil, you know, Askardu, and various other regions of 
this place at all. That has followed immediately that people thinking that Article 370 will be removed and then honey and butter and milk will follow into reverse subject. That has not happened at all. It has completely ruined the state. That's my understanding because I'm a Kashmir watcher, I'm a Kashmiri, I have studied Kashmir history and I'm there at the ground level in the field watching everyday people, talking everyday thousands of people when I go to Kashmir. Every moment, seeking informally their opinions as to what do you think about this situation. Nobody's happy in turn. You look at the Kashmiri, leave aside the Kashmiri Hindu, we'll talk about that later. You look at the Kashmiri Muslim diaspora all over the world. Look at the networking and they feel all completely distrust after the removal of Article 370. So therefore, we have not been able to settle the Kashmir's issue. And look at the politics. As I said, that one point is that we have increased militarization of the region. The second important thing is that we have facilitated ultimately the great displacement of Kashmiri Pandit community from Kashmir. The great displacement. Large chunk of people, nearly four or five lakhs of people have been forced to migrate to other parts and, you know, brutally dotted to the ground in various regions of India. with secure, with voluntary, with fear, with all kinds of ills. So therefore, they obviously, they have been forced to migrate because of these circumstances and Kashmir crisis to various parts of the world. Now, Article 370 is already over. Have we been in a position to resettle them back in the valley? Have we been in a position to develop that kind of an atmosphere again to take them? None of them is prepared to go, number one. Let me tell you, we may shout from rooftops, my Kashmir, Apna Kashmir, this Kashmir, that Kashmir, but nobody is prepared to go because things have changed a lot from 1990. Societies are not static that they will be waiting for us we go. When I go to my village, I don't recognize all faces because most of them have died and the young generation has come out. They don't know who is Haglu, what is Kashmiriya. They don't know the, what was old Kashmir, what were the relationships. How did society live for centuries? They are not bothered about that. They are bothered with that is of the age, such a new generation. So that has not been in a position. They have not been in a position in government to solve the problems. If on one side the Kashmir has remained completely distant, on the other side, you find this committee of pundits has also been left in lurch. There is nothing that has been done to patronize them, to save them from these crises, to take them back to their place. Lacks of them have also died now because of being in a different environment, because of climate of rest of the country, which is not suitable to them, because of depression, because they have been for a long period of time outside their houses, because of multiple disease system that has gone on them. And they don't belong anywhere. You know, we may talk in terms of integration of nature, integration of this, but I have personally found it that if a Kashmiri gets a job in Assam, the people protest, first of all, why not Assamese first? Why Kashmiri? That has been another misery for Kashmiri people. I found lots of Kashmiris, in fact, who were hunted in different institutions, including myself. The other important thing in the present perspective is, are those Kashmiris, why leave aside the Pandit case, which is agony altogether, what about the Kashmiri Muslims who are already there? Are they completely satisfied with the measures adopted by government of India? Do they have still inclination towards Pakistan, which is conflicting and battling itself? Then, why Kashmiris feel strangulated today? I would say the dominant perspective that dawns Kashmir, that's 
really overwhelming Kashmir of today, whether it is Kashmiri Pandit outside with them, Muslims in the valley and so on. You may see public going on in institutions with whatever nature and whatever capacity doing little work here and there. But let me tell you, the Kashmir is in a coma today. Kashmir is completely in a coma where there is no freedom of press because the expressions have been completely strangulated. And this situation is very dangerous, not only for Kashmiris, this situation is very dangerous for entire India. Because you must remember that when bacteria fascism grows, it grows there only when demotivation towards this democratic process begins. You know, you go and talk to anybody in Kashmir, they are no more bothered about elections. They are not interested in just politics or Kashmiri politics at all. Everybody wants to have two bail as a job and like that, he's not interested in politics. And when demotivation towards politics at the grassroots level begins, that is beginning of the bacteria of fascism, which government of India needs to take note of. I think when we look at contemporary Kashmir, when we judge all these details, we find that the postmodern polity in Kashmir has just begun now. The postmodern polity. You see, uh, We have on one side such a huge center in Indian state, a very big center of the state. But the center has been for the past decade or so, or maybe a little more, has been living on false political loyalties. And that's also dangerous because presently, if you look at the legitimacy is sought through coercion, where there are no individual democratic choices for individuals and institutions. I call it a digital legitimacy. We are seeking legitimacy on Facebook, what is up. We count that as legitimacy. When people speak about the strong ruler, when people speak about the popularity of the ruler, by all false reports on what is up, which takes very little a flick of a second to grow across all continents on WhatsApp. Digital legitimacy, but when you look at ground level, there's no legitimacy. Because if you look at the democracy, the democracy in India, including Kashmir, has fatigued both at the center as well as in institutions because Indian state and society has not reinforced it with vigor. We do not find that Indian system or Indian politics has reinforced that democracy with vigor. When I say vigor, look at the institutions. You bring in people to man them who are incompetent to run them. You haunt them if they want to run them in an integrated manner. There is institutional decay all over, and government should notice that. The public opinion all over India is contaminated with prejudice. See, I'm not saying that there is a prejudice against only BJP. There are different prejudices. In a country where a legitimate political party which has fought freedom struggle is not in a position you know, to remove, replace a leader, Rahul Gandhi or Sonia Gandhi or Anil Gandhi or whoever it may be, and bring in a competent person to reinforce policy. If that is not happening, what is country doing in fact? What is polity and democracy doing? That's why I said that Indian democracy has fatigued because nobody has will to reinforce with the vigor and develop the institutional infrastructure has strong institutions. You know. 
I am not here to shower praises on any particular political ideology and power. But I am in a small way trying to look at things critically because my great guru has taught me that criticism grows knowledge. If we look at things very critically, it grows knowledge. So therefore, let's all look at all these items very critically. What's happening to each other, it should be of concern of every Indian today. Because today it could be in Kashmir, tomorrow it could be some other region. Day after it could be some other region. Because like pigeons, we set, you know, we, we shut our eyes to reality. And then when we open it, we find by the time the cat has already eaten all of us. Public look at the other feature of this fatigue of democracies, apart from institutions, you also look at public. The public is totally polarized, not only politically, but more so socially, religiously, regionally, and other grounds. It's polarized between Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Sikh. Hindu Sikh is not together. Christian Muslim is not together. Dalit Hindu is not together. Dalit Muslim is not together. OBC is differently. There are bits and pieces of the society which are operating present. I really admire those politicians who are just with one thread or the other thread managing and trying to survive in politics. But actually, if you look at the ground level, we found that they are totally polarized, not only politically, but more so on social, religion, regional, caste, and other grounds. Sometimes I look at it because we feel that the transition from Congress to the present political party was accompanied by certain inherent contradictions. You know, when this transition took place, there were certain inherent weaknesses, inherent, you know, conditions. That did not allow the new politics to transcend from party to government. If I had asked you to characterize the present polity, I say it's a party which is ruling because party has not been in a position to transcend to politics. So long as you are in party, you care for the party. When you transition from party to power in politics, you know, as a ruling element, then you are no more party. You are the patron of all people. You have responsibility of every citizen. You have responsibility of even animals, plants, trees, forests, every damn thing, rivers. That's your responsibility when you transcend. But I am repeatedly getting this feeling that we have not, in this transition, we have not transcended from party to the ruling politics. As a result, what happens? Lots of government's energy goes in litting the fires or litting or firefighting. You know, you create one fire to fight the another fire. Your most of the energy is gone and therefore you are provided with very little time to do any creative work in this nation. Very creative work could be done, but that's not how many noble laureates do we produce? We have, we drag around and say, that we have 1.30 billion people. What are these 1.30 billion doing other than getting on to what is up and social media? If we compare ourselves with Nehru era, how many mathematicians are we producing now? How many physicists are we producing? How many top engineers are we producing now? What is that country has done for the last two decades? Anything of significance? I mean, if you make lists other than Communalism, communal rights, breaking up states, you know, all these kinds of things. We have not been in a position when we compare with China, you look at the indexes, how many millions China has lifted from the level of poverty. We are not concerned whether Chinese is a communist party, a military regime or whatever it may be, but it has lifted people from, you know, power levels of poverty. It's in a position to talk very loudly with Americans. Look at present political scenario and the foreign policy of India recently. When this Ukraine war took place, we are not in a position to show our face. You see, in the Nehruvian era, also we were very close to Russia, but we were managing Americans also. Should a country to this big democracy be told that look at the consequences if you break the sanctions that we have imposed on right? A petty political secretary of some other country comes and makes the statement in Delhi that be prepared for facing consequences if you purchase oil from Russia and so on and break these things. 
these things may not have direct impact on Kashmir, but I am illustrating my agony here that where the country is going, there are bigger, bigger things happening. And in these crises, the Kashmir crisis is further, you know, expanding itself. It's enveloping, it's further expanding itself. And there is possibility of something big happening again and again, crisis developing again and again. Where is the question of taking Kashmir from the back in such circumstances? You see, we had certain freedoms earlier. Our intellectuals used to nationally and regionally debate and discuss the issues and provide solutions to the state for smooth and competent running of institutions. But today they are all abstaining themselves. Whoever is there, they are keeping themselves aloof. They are not participating because they feel threatened. We don't know whether this threat is visible or invisible or whether there is really a threat or not, but they all abstain from these things. As a result, we find that intellectual investment in the government has come to zero. There is no intellectual investment in the government. And when we look at Kashmir issue, in fact, there is completely zero intellectual investment in resolving Kashmir issue and Kashmir policy. So therefore, we are not in a position to develop a cohesive center that can take all these units, all these regions, including Kashmir together, resolve its problems in Indian polity and society so that we are not at crossroads. The institution of multiculturalism, the institutions of plurality, they are constantly collapsing. In fact, they seem to be in a flux now. Because Indian state is not in a position to provide a viable political ideology that could incorporate all these regions under one important and strong cohesive center. Multi party system in different regions, you know, we have in one region Congress ruling, in another region we have another political party ruling. That has been the tradition of India for a long period of time. It is not some, um, something new that in Himachal we have BJP, in Punjab we have AAP. Somewhere we have Congress. It has been the tradition, but the center has to think about its cohesiveness. Because the center is supposed it is answerable to people, is accountable to country. The center has to adopt a cohesive approach for bringing these elements together to develop a kind of consensus and a unity of purpose You know, within these different regions. Is that happening? These are the questions that we should really ask. But that is not happening, in fact. As a result, we Kashmiris also feel very let down. We have the only approach perhaps adopted that chalta hai in politics. It's going on, it will come around someday naturally because now people have also compromised with this. When they do not see any solution coming, therefore they have also compromised. Keeping all these circumstances view, I feel that Kashmir is seriously in a coma, administratively in a coma. It's not moving anywhere when we compare Kashmir with the rest of India's you know, approach and relationship. We do not feel that it's moving anywhere in terms of this direction. But when we look at from Pakistani perspective, we find that Kashmir is really progressing well as per the Pakistani lens is concerned. When you look at from a Pakistani lens, they still feel that India has not been in a position to develop that softness in the heart of an ordinary Kashmir for India's nation. That's my greatest worry. And that's the main perspective which we should all look for solution. With these words, I thank you. I shall be really delighted if there are questions because that's why I have deliberately cut short to have more time for discussion. Thank you all. I bow before my Guruji. Namaskar, sir. Thank you all. Anya, go on with the question on the session. Thank you so much, sir, for blessing us all with your expertise in the field. 
now the podium is open for the question answer session yes please aditi pandey has raised his hands yes please am i audible yes good afternoon so it was delightful listening to you uh, i had one question yes and that question pertains to the fact that uh, uh, while you were speaking i just unconsciously sort of, sort of started comparing the case of erstwhile state of hyderabad under nizams before independence and the case of kashmir as you told and one thing that i got confused with was the fact that uh under nizams the state of hyderabad was annexed under an operation called operation polo if uh, if my memory serves me right however having lived in hyderabad for close to 10 or uh, 11 years in fact i see that the case of hyderabad hyderabad is far far different and i must say much more better uh, uh because yes Yes, please. This is including Kashmir ones, but I was very young, so I will not speak about Kashmir. However, I will speak about Hyderabad, and I will say that I do look at it from a very affectionate eye. And considering the fact that it was a state that was annexed, whereas Kashmir was not a state which was annexed, even as you spoke about the history of Kashmir, I was just uh, trying to compare and trying to understand why is it that a that a state. in our stable state which was annexed is so peaceful and so uh, united with the fabric of this nation and uh, whereas kashmir is not that is question number 1 question number 2 is the fact that sir uh, question number 2 is the fact that sir uh, uh, it is true that the um, uh, the imposition of army in several different places is always always causes uh, you know rifts within society we have seen that in we have seen that in northeastern states of our country we have seen seen that in kashmir however we uh, as per recent reports afsp is going to be removed from has been removed in fact from many different states in northeastern uh, northeastern uh, northeastern states and as you told that uh, the fabric of this country is breaking down i wanted to uh, understand how is it that you see the fabric of this country breaking down the third question pertains to the foreign policy of this country and sir recently within last one and a half months uh, we've had the uh, high high highest of diplomats from all over the world trying to come uh, having come to india and trying to woo the indian government to take their stance whether they whether it be the uh, western stance or whether it be the russian stance and it is it is india which has sort of held on to its uh, held on to its own uh, on how should i put it you know stands that we are not going to take sides even as we uh, think that we should be taking sides and so uh, you and you said that the foreign policy of this country is breaking down so i wanted you to comment on that also that how do you think that the foreign policy of this country is not much better than what it was during nehruvian era because nehru wanted to have this non aligned approach aditya, but when aditya, sorry, sorry to sorry interrupt for interrupt uh, kindly ask your question in a brief way you are uh, just ask your question whatever your question ask one question don't ask so many questions in one round let me should i respond to mr pandey yes 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 you see uh, when we compare hyderabad with kashmir the two things are different a sparrow and horse can never be compared because hyderabad state does not have anybody you know in the neighborhood to facilitate this crisis and claim hyderabad on the other side while as in kashmir you have pakistan sitting next door therefore they are constantly making an effort to woo kashmiris which they have done from 1947 or 46 down, down to you know uh, present day so that has been one of the reasons that the two cases are completely different so far as the annexation of kashmir is concerned you know i wouldn't say it's an annexation because after hyderabad broke down you know we we say that uh power corrupts man absolute power corrupts absolutely therefore though no maharaja or no uh, sort of uh, sultan or noble at that point of time say uh, that uh, hyderabadi nawab for example at that point he, he was not also willing to give up his power 
for the sake of you know integration of the country at that point of time but since he collapsed quickly so therefore that integration was not of at that time in kashmir's case there was delay and delay going and i would give an interesting evidence you know at some place i read that the maharaja was in a position he contacted nawab of bhopal and nawab of hyderabad and others saying that i am prepared to even convert to islam if i am continue to stay in power you see you you must remember pandit ji he sent even his people you know why nehru became at that point of time very angry with uh, the prime minister that was sent by maharaja mr mahajan that time when he was sent he told nehru straight way he said if you are not giving me any military or other things i immediately from here itself i'll go to lahore and nehru got wild in fact you must read my book kashmir before the accident after and that archival material which is available in fact so that was altogether a different case when i am saying the countries i am not saying that countries fabric is breaking down but i am saying that there is a agony that the country is not moving forward when we used to completely see that it was really moving forward earlier not only in congress i i really compare it with the nehru era today we abuse nehru but look at the institutional foundation that he has given as father of modern india to this country can we deny that you know as historians as students of history can we deny nehru his little role you know that he played our big role that he played in developing this country that's my question and third thing when we say so many politicians came here you know so many bureaucrats or politicians from foreign policy or foreign ministers came from different directions to delhi to tell us because there's a battle going on that we should completely stop purchasing oil and other items from russia for example or we should side with openly with americans you know for such a long period of time there was a cold war going on we sided with russia but we managed with americans also that time no diplomats used to come they used to come for other reasons but nobody came us to persuade that you be with me or not with me that was not happening in international politics and that was not the way india was treated i mean did anybody come and say that you be prepared for the consequences you have seen that indian born american who was in security establishment and deputy secretary it came in paper everybody has seen it he gave the statements in bbc al jazeera and other uh, you know channels also that uh, india should be prepared to face the consequences i mean how dare you can say that to indians it's india which has to make its own choice be it modi or nehru or anybody else india has to make its own choices and we we, we say if you read vedas we say that the moksha is not moksha because we go in air and become completely attaining mukti moksha means to make a good choice so india has to make a good choice because it is you see the name of the diplomacy is that we have to learn to be friendly with everybody to serve the purpose of our country so therefore it's no question how many diplomats come to persuade us to be with them or not to be with them it's india which has to take its integrity personality of india has to take its stand with whom it stands in international politics because it is not india of 70s it's not india of 50s it's not india of mauryans and aryans or guptas it's india of 21st century we have gone ahead in fact so therefore india has to take its own decision now yes any other question yes sir Please. professor has pulse mukya you can unmute yourself so he has a question to ask yeah uh, uh, hello ratan no, sir, it was a delight namaskar it was a delight to hear you uh, uh, the depth of your uh, uh, research on this theme has has increased so much it has become you know absolutely overwhelming and the and the passion with which you know karl marx had once said about some somebody uh, about he made a remark truth without passion and passion without truth you know he was condemning that you see you you speak of truth without passion and you speak of passion without truth i was i found your uh, lecture was full of truth with passion and passion with truth you know it was wonderful but i was uh, delighted by i particularly i wanted to intervene just to say that i was delighted by your new term the new term that you have coined digital legitimacy it's a fantastic term it's a wonderful <laughs> term you know this term is going to stay with us it's a very innovative term very original term 
and absolutely fantastic term. And thank you very much, Ravan, for this Thanks. very, very delightful lecture. Thanks. Wonderful lecture. Overwhelmingly, uh, overwhelming lecture. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Professor. Now I'd like to ask Vivek to un unmute and ask his question. Abhishek, I feel that we should really give people a chance to ask as many questions if you people don't have constraint of time. I am here. I am completely free for this. Sir, and uh, Vivek can here. ask. Vivek, you can ask your question. Okay. Uh, sir, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Sir, my question is to you that uh, I usually uh, uh, doing research on uh, the Pakistani affairs. Like uh, I have... Uh, subscribe to UN channel and their channels too. Why the, um, their government and their leaders are uh, sticking to the point of Kashmir? Because it is a part of internal matter of India. In spite of knowing the history of uh, Kashmir, Kashmir was the only part of India from the older times. Uh, what is the situation? Why does it uh, happen after the resolution was taken up by uh, Nehru? Sanya, I really, I, I really thank you for your question. You know, the problem is basically when we look at Pakistan or for that matter, Indian politicians also sometimes, you know, Pakistan is set, starving for, you know, political ideology. It has no items in the bag of political ideology now because you have talked about Islam for such a long period of time and that has not fetched you anything at all. That has distanced you from Afghans, you know, when Pakistan talks in terms of Islam, if you look at Pak occupied Kashmir, there are 56 dialects. Tibetan, Urdu, Henko, Kashmiri, there are so many languages being spoken. There are so many ethnicities. At one point of time in 47, they wanted to bring all these people under one umbrella and they talked about Islam. But they are also now tired of talking about Islam. That is one of the reasons that they are picking up Kashmiris. Let me also tell you, I think if it was a political laboratory, I would request Modi ji that you give Kashmir for five minutes to Pakistan. After five minutes only, I tell you, Pakistan will say that we don't want Kashmir at all. And Kashmiris, those who have some love, little love, I would say, very few of them, for Pakistan, they would say, we would not like to see their faces. That's also true. So therefore, they are picking up question of Kashmir because it serves their constituencies. You know, it serves their constituency of bringing in various people, you see, for example. They have their internal battles. For example, you look at present political crisis of Pakistan. You know, Imran Khan is not treated as mainland Pakistani. Nawaz Sharif, has, there is a Punjabi domination in that area. And therefore, Nawaz Sharif, such a, uh, who, who has displayed a criminal behavior in, Indian, in Pakistani politics, he's again been booed and brought in back. These are the crises. Pakistan has legitimacy crisis. Pakistan is starving for legitimacy. Therefore, they keep on, you see, they are the ones who talked about Islamic democracy. They talked about, uh, you know, Nizami Mustafa. They talked about the goal of Jamaat Islami. You have seen initially in the very beginning itself, if you look at uh, the roots of the assassination of uh, Liaquat Ali Khan, at that point of time, they said, we are the builders of Islam in the South Asia. But Egyptians said that, who are you? You are nobody because you are converts. Real Muslims are we, Africans, you know, Arabs and all that. So you are nobody, in fact, in Islam. And when Layak Ali Khan was assassinated, if you look at that time, you know, the telegrams and say material which is available in Delhi archive is also, you should look at that. How an American diplomat writes to his superior boss in America, Washington, and says that I have talked to Ayub Khan and Ayub Khan happens to be very friendly nature. I think we can manage with them. And after a couple of days, you find that Liaquat Ali Khan was no more. It was Ayub Khan who started calling shots with him. You know, that time, Dhaka and other universities and giving statements in favor of various pacts that Pakistanis, Arabs, and Americans were facilitating at that point of time. Pakistan is a serious crisis of legitimacy. I think in all polities, there are crises of legitimacy. Maybe we had not seen this phase of, therefore, we are talking of religiosity in Kashmir. Pakistan has got tired of religiosity. They want something else. So, therefore, they have Kashmir in the, you know, background for this. Otherwise, they, Pakistan has no sympathy for, you know, uh, Kashmiris at all. And Kashmiris also in the hearts of their hearts, they also know Kashmiris want a solution to their problem. 
you know, they never wanted Article 370, was not of much help. But today they feel really, I can tell you, if you go house to house, I can tell you 99.9% .9 people are not happy with it. It was a kind of psychological uh, networking in politics. So they have no love for Pakistan at all. But Pakistan will continue to raise it because it suits their internal politics. Yes, any other? Yes. There are a question in the chat box, so you can read. Yes, yes. Yes, please. No, one more hand is. Yeah. Anand, you can ask. Anand Kaur can ask this question. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Sir, first of all, I would like to say that it was a very, very fantastic lecture. You talked about Kashmir. And as a Kashmiri pundit myself, I was very pleased to know about more about my more about my hometown's history. And I would like to ask you a question that when I I always hear of stories about my from my grandparents, my mother, my father. And I would like to ask you, why did a central government, why did the government actually, Indian government didn't help the Kashmiri Pandit at the time of mass exodus day when they were killed brutally in the public? Why didn't the center didn't help at all? And people say that, that Ankit Pandey earlier said that it was an annexation. So, but was it was really an annexation or a gen genocide? Like it was not like the Pakistan, you know, like not like the Pakistan was like taking over the place. It was like it was just like they were killing every person in the site and they didn't have any mercy. The women were killed, brutally murdered, it cut it open into half. You see, Anand, I, I really love your question as a Kashmiri pundit. Personally, you know, being a Kashmiri and having also suffered uh, much more than many other Kashmiris who are really, you know, running around with these different kinds of notions. But uh, you see, Jamaat Islami's goal was that you create a scare in Kashmir. You kill different people. In fact, if you look at, for example, the first person who was killed before Tiklal Teplu, before Prem Nadbad, before Sarvanand Kohl Premi, it was basically not even, even on television, they keep on talking in terms of national conferences that our person was, that Halwai who was MLA, he was killed. It was much before anybody was killed. It was SHO of one of the places that uh, Mysuma Bazar police station who was killed broad daylight, you know? He was the first person who was killed. And then, of course, killings continued. Now, you see, I have seen, I think this, this question really requires a little more answer. We say among the Kashmiri Pandits, they say, we have been killed, a large number of us have been killed. There's no doubt about it. Maybe 1,000 people must have been killed. You know, when we look at all these data and so on, uh, touching 1,000 or so, or maybe less than that, uh, was killed, there is no doubt. We say Kashmiris, you know, the Kashmiri Pandit feels today, he says that we have been killed because we were not wanting freedom, why should they kill us? So we were not wanting freedom, or we did not want to go to Pakistan, why should they kill us? Which is a reasonable argument. I put the same question, question to Kashmiri Muslims. They say, but you see, we some of us were wanting freedom at that point of time, but it was because of the threat of the gun, you know, because of the threat of the gun that many Muslims who wanted to help Hindus, to save Hindus, could not really help. They just, because they wanted to help, they could not help because they, they were also being killed. You have seen nearly a lack of Muslims must have been killed from that beginning in different kinds of violence, be it security, be it militant, be it uh, Pakistan and others. Large number of Muslims were also killed. But the only question that Kashmiri Pandit is asking that we were not wanting independence or freedom or anything, why should we be killed? Which is genuine, of course, I, I certainly feel. But to call it a genocide or to how do we characterize this uh, killing of Kashmiris, you know, is, is my feeling is that uh, there should be some appropriate term after uh, studying this whole phenomenon of violence in Kashmir's case. Because we say genocide, if this is genocide, what about Jews? What happens to them? Then uh, there are other people also, in fact, uh, you know, in Kashmiri, among Kashmiris who have a different opinion about it. But it was, I don't deny the fact that uh, Kashmiri Pandit suffered the worst in the entire scenario because you know, uh, so many people were killed and they had to leave their properties, they had to leave their homes and suddenly toss the various trees in India and other places without resources and so on. You see, that's one thing. Let me also tell you one interesting thing here. You know, Anand, 
For example, Kashmiris in that summer migrated to Jammu. Now, in Jammu, it were our own Hindu population. For example, if we talk of Hinduism and Hindu Rashtra and Hindu religion and religion, why is it that Kashmiri small boys of class 2 to class 10th were not allowed to study in the schools? They were under the same government. But Jammu people protested that, no, these schools, Kashmiri boys, and as a result, what happened to Kashmiri boys? Many of them died because when they were put in tents, canvas tents, you know, uh, in, in the heat of 40 degree, 45 degree heat, the canvas tents they were put in. There's no arrangement. The schools belong to the JNK government, but that was not done. There was an apathy. Now, that fellow was not a Muslim. He was a Kashmiri Hindu. He was a Jammu Hindu. Or what did the Indian government do for us? They say all Jagmohan or anybody. It was all Kashmiri Hindu left because there were some targeted killings and burning of villages took place after that. And they were you know, forced to move from their local. There's no doubt about it. But I can also tell you, see, I give a simple example. I give an example that a Muslim teacher of uh, my friend's teacher, in fact, Muslim teacher in that locality, he came to a Hindu family saying that if you want to migrate now, Tell me what are the things and how I can help you. But I don't want to help you publicly because I, after you leave, I'll be killed. It's a genuine statement by them. It was under threat that they were not in a position to go. But there are a lot of people who have made a lot of great statements. So I, I find Habibullah, who was in charge of uh, some of the affairs in Kashmir at some point of time, he said, all MLAs, Muslim MLAs came to me and they said, no, 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 stop them from going. We'll help them. We all, you know, I, I have stated in my book also, that's a, a sort of, untruth told very sophisticated manner like that. That was not happening. And government of India remained silent. You see, if they have put up so much army now, why army did not do flag marches in 1990 when Kashmiri Hindus were killed? I mean, there was a VPC government. BJP was in hand in glove with them at that point of time. Why they did not do that time? Marches in different localities to save Kashmiri Hindus and say that, okay, we are here. We'll envelop. Today, they are enveloping villages in Kashmir, I have seen. Every local is enveloped by army post. Why not in 1990? What was happening? Why government's apathy was there so much? You know, these are the questions really we need to raise. Rather than getting influenced completely, we say, this file is, that file is, this has happened, that way. The killing has taken place. Any revolution, any protest, any, you know, sort of uh, protest movement or any militancy, any terrorism, people get killed. There's no doubt. They don't see Hindu, Muslim and other things and so on. Look at Yemen, look at Syria, look at Egypt, what has happened, look at Palestine, what's happening. I mean, we should look at it from a broader perspective of how polities are transcending, how they are changing, how different transitions are taking place, and what's happening to different countries. You know, we should not narrow it down to Hindu, Kashmiri, Hindu versus Kashmiri Muslim. And Anant, you must have seen when your Muslim neighbor comes to you in Delhi or Jammu, how sweetly your parents and uh, you know, those people are meeting each other and talking about the details and so on. That's also the another perspective of the same story. So therefore, I would say it was a very serious crisis of Kashmiri Pandits. They have uh, still not been able to, you know, overcome these difficulties. That's a genuine case. But to attribute it to simply in terms of religion is not good. Yes, please. Okay, uh, Radhika. Alok Dubey can ask this question. Okay. Ma'am, you're not audible. Hello, Professor Hanglu, how are you? Namaskar. Fine. Hello, Namaskar, Namaskar, how are you? Ah, it was a wonderful lecture. I, I was hearing it from the very beginning. And uh, it was, I really enjoyed each word you said. And Thank it you, uh, took me you. back to the uh, the, the, the uh, old uh, days of uh, Migration. Kashmir. Right, yes, right. yeah. It was a wonderful, wonderful uh, lecture hearing you after so many, so uh, such a long time. And Thank recently you. we we saw that movie also that was released on Kashmir. Right. So uh, that was I guess just a, a very little what they had shown actually what happened. But then uh, what you said today was good. I really liked and we want to hear more of your lectures, such lectures on Kashmiri civilization and on Kashmir and so many other our culture and on so many things because we belong to the same community. Right. So absolutely. I like to hear more about Kashmir. We want to go back to our 
state and uh, the oh, oh, the uh, the typical culture we have which is very different from the rest of india That's india right so but yes nice. so very nice viewing it and seeing you after such a long time thank namaskar. you thank you namaskar yeah you see uh, one point there in fact regarding kashmir files you very rightly said that you know if we look at the problems that kashmiri pandits faced in terms of you know violence and so on then yes. i would i have also seen kashmir files i was not gripped by it so much because i have seen much more violence happening with the kashmiri pandits than was reflected by this film yes exactly you see that, that, that was, was that was reflected so there is yeah. much more in fact this if a film has to be made it said that something you know well begin is half done i would say uh, sorry uh, yeah well begin is half done i would like to say if they had to really make a film on this it should have been made little more larger and some part of pakistan's role should have been brought in american yes. diplomacy should have been brought in i would like abhishek i would like to mention here in fact that's why i was asking let there be more time for questions you know zirinsky who was cia expert and top brass of america he visited pakistan and the entire malaysia that had been collected in pakistan for and afghanistan for defeating russians soviet union at that point of time in 1886 87 and so on then zaiul haq he says to zirinsky sir what do i do with these foreign militants which you have gathered in pakistan and which are helping you know afghanistan to liberate it from soviet union and break soviet union you know what yeah. zirinsky said zirinsky picked up klashenkov and said that you send them here and after this they will relieve kashmir of the bird it's a yeah. statement you can read that book i am forgetting the name of the author oh yes westard w e i s t a r d Westard, you read his full name in in yes. Google. Westard has written a book on you know Cold War. You look at the documentation that CIA has released and see that mm. was happening at that time. So the involvement of Pakistan was immense. It was international politics that subjected. Therefore, Kashmiri Pandit was simply a pawn in the hands of you know J and K government, I would say, and central government of India at that point of time. but they were big big international players you know zirinsky says that pakistani president was in fact for afrin this a very important area to explore zirinsky says that it was very difficult to purchase these are the words that to purchase you know uh, zaiul haq because he was the costly president for us from pakistan uh, to demand more money when we purchased this is the word he says we purchased him you yes. can imagine and i congratulate for you, you for the new books you have written recently also yeah yeah kashmir before many... the accession and after ji ji bahut bahut mubarak aap is cheez ke liye thank you and so i think much. and i think uh, what what uh, this director in this movie the kashmir files has shown is just very little very little not very even little, yeah. exactly in fact you know it is it sometimes such films also they have different roles to play because election 2024 is due therefore you you need to look for materials <laughs> yes know, people begin to manufacture different materials because they need it for new election to come 24 and therefore such materials get used for you know invoking passions of public in different states yes. helps like that and if you develop a reconciliation between a kashmiri muslim and a hindu that may not fetch you good votes that may yeah, fetch right. you peaceful kashmir settlement of kashmiri problem but not uh, you know votes That has been. Yes, I wish that I wish that uh, the Kashmir, uh, Kashmir should become as it was earlier, that peaceful, beautiful valleys and beautiful Kashmir, so that we can once again go back and live there and spend we our can, time there. We can, you know, we can, we can. If yes. we have faith in God, we can only pray for that. I can say. Yes, only we can pray for that. Yes. So nice seeing you, Professor Thank Hanglu. You. Thank Namaskar. you. Namaskar. Namaskar and bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Uh, Radhika Pandita, you can ask your question. Am I audible? Yes, 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 yes you're Radhika, audible. Please. Uh, it was uh, to begin with, sir. It was a very, very enlightening lecture. Um, really uh, thankful that we got to experience that today. Uh, so again, as a fellow Kashmiri Pandit, I think uh, I've realized that in the aftermath of the exodus, uh, Kashmiri Pandit families. Uh, have kind of shied away from, uh, you know, propagating the culture of the community to the next generation. Like in my generation, personally speaking, the kids in my generation they're not interested in the history of our community, in the culture of our community, and I think that was 
uh, you know, a kind of side effect of the ethnic cleansing that uh, our previous generation went through. So that kind of cultural and um, sociological damage that the Exodus uh, dealt to our community. Uh, do you think there's a way to undo it or there's a way to like go back to the cultural roots that we had uh, and like to make our generation more aware of our history, our culture um, and like stuff like that? Radhika, welcome to this question. You know, it's a very, very important question you raised. Let me tell you, Radhika, there are two things. First of all, I would not agree with the term, you know, when people are telling us it's an ethnic cleansing. When we look at the ethnicity of Kashmiris, you know, we, we say we are generally, the, I, I really want these younger generations to know. Anant also, in fact, many other Kashmiri students and all over the country, in fact, even the country should also know it, you know. There is so much of migration that has taken place right from, you know, earlier times down to 1953 into Kashmir from Egypt, from Arab world, from Central Asia, from China, from various regions of the world into Kashmir. So there are multiple ethnicities that have grown into as we all Kashmiris project ourselves. I'll simply give you one small example here, you know. In 1953, 400 Turkish families came from uh, Kazakhstan. 400 families, actually, uh, Muslim families, they came from Kazakhstan in 1953. Sheikh Hudra, the day he was arrested, one day before that, he met them. 200 families left for Turkey, and rest of 200 families got mixed up. They stayed back in Kashmir, are part of Kashmiri people. Today, they must be also saying, give us the freedom, you know. We want to preserve our freedom in Kashmir, claiming themselves to be a Kashmiri, you know. So my point is that basically today they are also part and parcel of Kashmir. My basic point is that there are multiple ethnicity out of which Kashmiri Pandit community or Kashmiri Muslim community has sprouted. So this using ethnic cleansing, I by, by, by denying you uh, this term ethnic cleansing, I don't undermine the suffering of Kashmiris, no doubt. I don't undermine. I know that Kashmiri is Pandits also and Muslims also, they all have suffered. But it is international dimensions we do not see. What is being brought to us only Pakistan, Pakistan, Pakistan. You know, Pakistan has played a havoc with it, but Pakistan is also one bowler, one player in it. But there are many more players internationally who are interested in all this phenomenon to happen. In fact, because there's a cold war going on between Americans and the communism and the capitalism, you know, in the entire world. And Kashmir was a small operator in that, which suited to uh, a particular, you know, region and particular community or particular polity at that point of time, and as it, it was not. So for coming to the preservance of Kashmiri culture, for example, you know, when you were in Kashmir, when we were in Kashmir, in fact, for example, nobody stopped me from singing a Kashmiri song. Nobody stopped me from, you know, pursuing Sanskrit. Nobody stopped me from, I can tell you, nobody stopped us in terms of, uh, you know, developing our culture there, in fact. There's no stop. Nobody, you know, this is also a misnomer. I think we must also know. I tell it all to my friends and I'm telling you from here itself, I tell you. I have never, we never heard that a Kashmiri Muslim reputation. Just not even one example. There may be some politics of Parmeshwari case of marriage. There may be some other case, but the relationship is between the communities were much better than any part of India. It has got spoiled because of this Cold War politics and it has distanced the two communities now and the violence that was unleashed. As is that we are not in a position now to bridge this gap. If this gap has to bridge it, then we have to take certain steps to see to it that this gap becomes smaller day by day. But that's not happening on the part of many of us because we are widening that gap day in and day out like that. We don't deny that there is a violence that has taken. We don't deny the suffering of Kashmiri Pants. I am also a Kashmiri. In my village, there were 47 houses. All the 47 were burned. If houses were burned, what happened to the stones and the bricks? A brick and stone does not get burned. Come what may. You know, even a nuclear explosion also, I find. But all of them have been taken away. They have plundered in these villages and certain people in those areas, wherever it happened. But majority of them are also missing us, in fact. They also have sympathy for us and, uh, you know, our problems and so on. So therefore, Kashmiris from both the sides, both the communities shall have to bridge this gap 
they have to come under one umbrella and sort out the issues before the government politicizes it through film, through any other means or through you know any discussion. I think Kashmiris themselves have to be very active on this front. And preserving one's culture certainly is a necessity and historical inevitability. There's no doubt about it. But culture does not also remain static. It gets influenced by many things over a period of time, for example. That happens because when you, you go to different areas, different places, you certainly find, you know, lots of other cultures also imposing. I can give you a small example here. You know, when Indians migrated to Trinidad, Tobago, uh, Grenada, and other various regions into West Indies area, there were many people from Bengal. There were many people from Punjab. Majority of the people were from UP and Bihar. And it is the way religion and culture is perceived in UP and Bihar that remained a dominant reference point for that entire community in Trinidad. Because they were in majority, therefore they influenced others. But it's a good question they have asked. We should not shy away from our culture. No doubt, I really appreciate that. Yes, any other? Yes, sir. Me, Zubair, Nabi, you can ask a question. You can ask okay. a question. Hello, sir. Hello, Zubair. Yes, please. Uh, sir, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, sir. I have, sir, listened to your whole discussion, whole lecture, sir. It was very well. Sir, but one thing that I want to ask, sir, a lot of... Friends have raised this question that what happened in 90s, that is genocide. But sir, as a Kashmiri, I am feeling ashamed. What happened in 1990s, that is a big stand, sir. And uh, we know history witnessed how every community in Kashmir has suffered brutally. Yes, yes, I agree. That. Yeah. I'm very, I'm very ashamed for what happened in 1990s was that facilitated. There were some fringe elements in society who just uh, done this cowardly act. But sir, uh, but but sir, we I think we left to four decades, right? From 90s, 50s to 1990s. What happened? We have given the constitutional status. What happened in 1987? Rigid, uh, rigid election where happened, sir. But sir, do you think that these things have been should be raised? How the uh, Kashmiris uh, were being, uh, whether it is a uh, Hindu community or as a Muslim community, we have given the constitutional status back in uh, after the Delhi Agreement, and how the constitutional st status was, it was decided that it will be preserved in future too. Uh, if we talk about the Nehru's 1954 speech, or we talk about the Sheikh Abdullah speech in Legislative Assembly in 1960s, how the how uh, the Kashmiris were uh, were uh, being satisfied by this concept that uh, with India you will be your culture will be saved and you, are, you will be guiding the constitution. But sir, what happened in 2019, 2019 at uh, 5th August, sir? Right. Beyond the, okay. beyond the, the uh, abrogation of article, how we were being uh, under the communication blockade. I still know I was in Delhi and I didn't talk with my family for months. And that was a psychological war. Why you are not talking about that? Okay, okay, okay. My question yes. is, sir, is that? Yes, Zubair, very important this question you raised. Let me come to you. You see, this is why I said that, you know, in a lecture, I can only provide a kind of synoptic because we have time maybe one hour or two hours. But let me tell you, I did say that when Sheikh Abdullah wanted to settle the political future of Kashmir before 1953, in that case, what happened? He was promised so many things in, of which the Delhi Agreement was part. But then ultimately, he was not given anything at that point of time. He was frustrated. You read my book. He was completely frustrated as a result of which he moved out of this entire arrangement. You know, there is no doubt. That's what I'm saying from 47 till date. There are different governments in India that came, but they never respected the will of Kashmiris and never tried to understand the ground reality in Kashmir as a result of which Kashmiris got divided and are suffering. That is one part of the picture. The second part of the picture is that some people genuinely made a choice after, you know, not only uh, 87 election. In 1965 also there was an association. At that point of time, it was called Al-Fatah, who sided with Pakistan. So 87 elections were not only rigged in 87, I would say in Kashmir, there was never a peaceful election. Never at all, all elections in Kashmir, most of the elections in Kashmir were rigged like Bihar and other places. You know, we, we know that they were completely rigged. But then there would have been a democratic solution rather than running to Pakistan and 
you know, going to the lap of Pakistan and telling them you come and sort out our issue. Neighbor's duty politically is always, you know, neighbor's duty politically is to destabilize its neighbor, not to help it. Now, has Pakistan helped to democratize Kashmir and provide Kashmiris a better election than 87? I think 87 election was much better than any election that took place after 87. You know, it was relatively, I would say, shared better than what happened in 87. Because other elections were also, which were done after 87, were also not, you know, uh, devoid of rigging and so on. That's one thing. Second, we Kashmiris, we say that we are shameful what happened in 1990. Initially, we should not have given space to those elements in our society, for example. You know, what Kashmiri Pandit says that if majority of Muslims should not have come into, uh, you know, a procession, rather than they should come and tell them that, look here, let us have a meeting with these people. But people got scared of guns. And they are people who facilitated this coming up guns, violence, and so on. People were scared also of talking to these elements. That happened. There was a mess completely because breakdown of state and central machinery had already taken place. That was also there. So what else you say that I, there's, people are suffering? There is no doubt. You, you, If you are saying that I have not talked about Article 370 and so on, you read my book and read some of the articles in Greater Kashmir, which I wrote that time for suffering of people. The worst suffering, you know, stopping press, even sending a proper information to other agencies in India. Look about, look at the children whose families were in US, children were studying in different institutions, whether they have money, whether they have, you know, all kinds of suffering, medical problems and so on. That was the worst part that you cut up. I condemn that very seriously and openly. I really condemn what happened when Article 370 was abolished and people were put under lockup. You know, I seriously condemn that. Because many people have, there's no doubt about it, simply students in different places, but even medical, you know, assistance was not provided to people in time at that. These are wrong doings. That's why I'm really angry. And I say this is my agony because whom I can tell. I can, as a historian, I can only express anguish about it. I cannot go and, uh, you know, tell the prime minister or the president that, look, here, you stop doing this, you stop that. That is for that is a democratic process like that. But certainly, I would say Kashmir has been ill-treated. I think one word would be better to say that Kashmir and Kashmiris, be they Panditas, be they Muslims. Yes, I know among the Muslims how different people lost their children, their families, completely devastated in many parts of Kashmir. But then Kashmiris themselves have to also make up their mind what do they want. You know, I cannot go to Delhi University on one side, but I come back and say, Naim Ujim Nizai Mustafa Chandra. Either I have Nizam Mustafa or I have Kashmir, because if I stand two legs, you know, neither I'll go forward nor I'll go backward. Kashmiris and mass need to take a decision. Anaf is Anaf, we want this. Whatever is in their mind. If they want to stay, be comfortable, if they have made a choice, let it be okay. If they still have doubts about it, they need to express themselves and tell openly what is in their mind. Because as a result of few people who neither go that side nor go this side, the larger community of Kashmiri Hindus and Muslims is suffering. And these such elements you have, you know, of dual nature in every community. You can't escape that. That's my answer to your question, Ibe. The last question for the day, Ruhit, you can ask your question. You have raised hand. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Rashid. Yes, please tell me. Uh, thank you, Mr. Zubair, for the question. Actually, he's my classmate. And, sir, it's not a question. It's a message, basically. Yes, so the please. message is, sir, the past is past, actually. So we have suffered. The Muslim community had suffered. We, So I'm a Muslim as well. And uh, Pandits, Hindus, they suffered as well. So I'm from Kazigun, sir. Hope you know that place. Yes, so yes I know still, it very well. So we still have relations with our Kashmiri uh, friends, sir. My grandfather, he's having Kashmiri friend from, sir. He's living in Delhi right now. So he visits us on Eid. So when we were having sorrow or happiness, so any, uh, anything, sir, whatever. Yes. So he visits us. So basically, we should uh, see what, what's the option left. We should live in peace. So there is no thing, sir, we will we'll be discussing such those it's like so uh, mm. the movie was that right so so we should on the both sides we should look what is the option we should choose peace so there is nothing so we can 
do Rashid, about our past. Yes, so yes, we can Rashid, just make our future you, better, sir. Right. Rishi, this is, you know, sir. your option and your opinion is absolutely correct. You know, that we cannot keep looking backwards only. We should look for what is the... We cannot carry these battles to future generations. We must put a full stop somewhere and move ahead. There's no doubt about that. But do all people think like that? Only I'm telling you, only yesterday in Kazigund, if you are belonging to Kazigund, you know Kulgam Kakran. You know, yesterday only somebody was killed there. What is that? I mean, why people of the area have not come out and condemned it? It's their neighbor. It's a co Kashmiri who has been killed. That's not fair. People have to make up, and Masay, they have to make up mind what do we want? Do we want to move forward? Do we want to stay in this conflict? Do we want to go to Pakistan? Do we want independence? What is the viable relationship or viable, you know, uh, sort of road for us to move forward in society, to live in this region comfortably? I think, first of all, we have to give up complete violence and think very seriously about our what's our future. You know, what do we support in our hearts and minds? We have to decide that. And then only we can move forward. There could be a reconciliation of the communities. They could meet each other. They can discuss all these problems. And this has this is not to me as a historian. It's not something new that has happened. Fourteenth century was full of violence. Mughals came full of violence. Afghans came full of violence. If you look at fourteenth century when Laleshwari was living, irrespective of Hindu and a Muslim, thousands of Kashmiri women were raped and taken as slaves and sold in Central Asian market and Arab world. By Mongols, not Muslims. Mongols were not, they had not accepted Islam by that time when they did it. If you look at, irrespective of religion and so on. But we moved on. So violence has always taken place in different parts of, you know, history, different times and so on. So therefore, people themselves have to choose whether we want violence to continue or we want to live as good human beings like that. Pranita Sahib, Namaskar. Can you proceed? Yes, please. Thank you so much, sir, for answering the questions. You uh, have now. Okay, I'd like yeah. to uh, yeah. now. I'd like to call upon Abhishek, sir, to extend the vote. Okay, Mr. Pandita wants to say something. He is there. Just okay, sir. Okay, sir. He can yeah, unmute him for a moment. Okay, sir. You can unmute Pandita, sir. Uh -huh. So, sir, Hanglu, it was a delight to hear you. Namaskar, Namaskar. Namaskar. As uh, it must be evident from my surname, I am a Kashmiri Hindu. And while listening to you, two questions crop up in my mind. Yes, please. Firstly, let me say, it's difficult to rid the mind of the thoughts about Kashmir as Kashmiri. Right. Earlier, I used to live in Kashmir. Now, Kashmir lives in me. Yeah. So, with this Wonderful. background of my thought, I have two small observations on your lecture. Yes, please. Kashmir is a happy place for all those people who visit it. But not so for those who live there. Second, in earlier times, People would come to Kashmir for learning and pilgrimage. Right. Now only for tourism. In your opinion, is this change of perception that holds the key to the Wex Kashmir problem? Thank you for the question, Banta Sahib. Uh, let me first of all, when you said that it's very difficult to read the mind of Kashmiris, I think Nehru has characterized it very well. Because when Sheikh Udra used to go and meet Nehru, he would say 40 lakhs of people are with me. When Bakshi went and met him, he would say 40 lakhs are with me. When somebody right. else went and said, he said, he said, yeah. there is population of only 40 lakhs. I want to know which 40 lakhs you are talking of. You know, likewise, it's very difficult to read the mind of Kashmir. The second thing I, that I have a small observation here. Pardon me. Right, the right. The problem is not Kashmir. 
In my right. view, Kashmiris. the problem is Kashmiri. Kashmiris, that's what I am telling you. Yeah, certainly, Kashmiri is only because first of all, they have to make up their mind. You know what they want. That's what I was telling Zubair and Rishi that first and and this Anant also that Kashmiris have to decide first of all what do they want. That's Very one true. important thing. Very true. Second, that Kashmiris who visit them really are happy, and those Kashmiris who are there are not happy. That is also true for all ages. Because you see, you look at apart from say forced conversion or voluntary conversion, leaving that aside, look at the people have always come out and never gone back. That's how Greater Kailash, you know, proliferated and developed in Delhi, for example, Chamunath uh, Pandit Road in Calcutta. Some other places, uh, people and so on, even Hyderabad also, a large group of correct, people correct, on, right, correct. during yes. the Nawab's time and never turned back. Yes. Or Faisabad, or Lucknow, or Allahabad. At that point of time, many people left to seek opportunities and there's no wrong in that, you know, seeking opportunities and that. And the last point, I would like you to repeat last point, please. The last point that you... Earlier, have. people used to come for pilgrimage and learning. Okay. Now they only come for tourism. Tourism, yeah. Right. Because you see, now they come for tourism in the sense, there are two things. One is that environment in India has been completely destroyed. And second <laughs> is that in Kashmir, there is no center of learning anymore. There's nothing to learn in Kashmir. No center of learning today. Because if you look at, you know, uh, this 10th century writer, I'm forgetting his name. A very famous Al-Baruni. Al-Baruni. No, no, no. The Sanskritist. Uh, who wrote Deshubdesh, Narmamala, and others? I am forgetting his name. Shemendra. Shemendra, yeah. Shemendra says, and I was reading one of his, you know, uh, stories. He says a Bengali fellow has come few days back, and he stays in locality to learn. He was very fragile, very black. Now he's after a year, his complexion has changed, and he has become <laughs> little fat. He has put on little weight. This is what Shemendra says, in fact. And then he says about the learning of Sanskrit. Or, for example, you know, uh, Hewan Song, when he came, we today claim, we say, Zithir, Zithir is a Devi Asthapan and all that. It is not. Desh Rudra was a Buddhist site. And Hewan Song came, he said, look here, I was amazed to see Kashmir is speaking wonderful Sanskrit. I had decided to stay here 15 days. Now I'll stay here for two months. Appreciating because there was something to learn from them. Or, for example, you know, Constantine and Diocletian, the two European brothers who made Roman Empire. Constantine, in who developed Christianity also after the Christ oh, and made it institutionalized oh, religion. Oh. Constantine's brother, when Diocletian got leprosy, his deputy tells him, Sir, it can be only cured in Kashmir. Let us go to Romania. From Romania, we go to Kashmir to get the leprosy cured. Today, there is nobody to cure those leprosies. I fully agree it with you. It is destroyed you. beyond a point. And in this, I would openly say, that there's a greater role played by not only politicians from both the sides, Pakistani politicians, Kashmiri politicians, Indian politicians, but there is also a very, very important role played by intellectuals and bureaucrats. Thank you very much, sir. Provided Thank you wonderful very much, narratives sir. here and there to, you know, to destroy Kashmir further. Thank you. It's a pleasure seeing you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Namaskar. Namaskar. Thank Sonia, you, sir. I... Yes, sir, you can. Um, that's a long session. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Arnanglu, sir, for such a wonderful eye-opening lecture on Kashmir, which is the reason in uh, turmoil, especially these days. It has always been an exciting experience to listen to your talks and public lectures that come up with something that forces students of history like me to think beyond the center-centric approach of history. Thinking about, uh, talk, as you talked about multiculturalism, uh, de delimitation and limitation, and the digital legitimacy, as uh, Professor Mukhya also highlighted this term. These are the key words of today's lecture. And I think all the budding historians or students of history should follow and think about these words. I do not have words uh, to express your fearless intellectualism, uh, that's why I'm using uh, some lines of uh, the great poet Hariman Rai Bachchan. Diggaj bhi jisse kaan puthe, aisa bhishan hun kaar liye, nabhim kirno ki si talta, nabjwala mukhyon ki dhekan. So you have that uncompromising attitude as a historian. And simultaneously, you are an amazing scholar who trained many, many historians who are serving 
in different uh, universities of this country. My mentor is one of your student, uh, Dr. Yasser Arafat, yes. and he is also training me like you trained your students. Yes, he's absolutely bright person. He I hope in bright. academia will have uh, the opportunities to hear you uh, and engage with you uh, for a long time to come. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart, sir. Uh, I also want to thank Professor Mukhya is not here, but for his constant support because he always joins our program. And the other esteemed ones, SN Pandita sir is here. Uh, Sobhas Sarkar sir uh, uh, was also part of this program some moments ago. And the other esteemed uh, scholars- There is Dr. Shubhan Prasad also. Uh, uh, yes, from the Banas Allahabad University. So oh, I yes. thank all of them uh, from the bottom of my heart. And uh, so moving ahead, like uh, it is a kind of ritual. So I also want to thank uh, our principal, sir, for his constant support and our teacher in charge, Aswini, sir, for his endless encouragement and uh, the other colleagues who are here and especially the team origin and the students of origin who are working. Uh, this particular group as a vibrant group, are, they are making the history society of this Bandhu College very vibrant and uh, are, my all the, are all the students who are part of uh, this journey so that we can emerge as a good history society of, at Delhi University. So I thank all of them and thank you once again, sir. Thank you so much. I thank you all for uh, time, patience. It's only a small synoptic that can be provided in one hour. I also admire uh, Mr. Yasir Arafat. He's very dear to me, in fact. My wonderful student, I have learned always from my students. Thank you all. God bless Sir, you. Please stay here for a picture, group picture, with teachers and my oh, students. Yeah. yeah. Vikas, sir, kindly click a picture. Yeah. Done. Thank you. Okay. So our next uh, 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 ne ne next talk of this webinar series will be on 22nd of April. Uh, Professor Salil Mishra will be speaking on... Yes, yes. Another. On India... India Yes, sir. From civilization to a nation. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Shankarji. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Could I end the meeting, sir? Yeah.